good to be special. And um, when I came in, Jerry was sitting on the reserved sign there, and I said, that's very apt. It's just like you, reserved. <laughs> so he's reserved, and I'm special. We all have a reputation. And um, yeah, I understand I sound different, and it's true. But when I hear God in the inner part of my being, His voice is South African. <laughs> so I think He has special favor for us Africans. Anyway, it's just my little theory. Um, it's an absolute delight to be with you for these next few days, tonight, Tuesday, and Wednesday, as we continue on the move of the Spirit. We started on Saturday ministering to some of the leaders, and then Sunday morning, Sunday night with the graduation as well. That was just such a highlight, and, uh, and he just did such a great job in presenting those students. I just was like blown away at the quality of the slide and the way that the graduates were viewed by the leadership of this church. It was just an amazing thing to see, and uh, of course, Jerry, that cake was really good last night. Thank you. I leave you're a bigger man than what I came. I have been greatly enlarged in my capacity. <laughs> it was good. I'm waiting for that chocolate cake you spoke about for Christmas, you know, that one. That just sounds like I need to be here for a Christmas service or something, you know. That will just be, like, amazing to eat chocolate cake. Anyway, I deviate. Someone's sitting there going, oh, man, I was hungry. Now I'm famished. <laughs> Go with me in your Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 1, and then I'm going to pray, and we'll go into the Word of the Lord. Lord God Almighty, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the resurrected, glorified Christ the one who came and gave himself for us, that we may have not only abundant life on earth, but everlasting life. Thank you that you paid the price that we could not pay, and you redeemed us out of darkness and brought us into your marvelous light. And today we are the subjects of your grace and of your rule and of your reign, and you are our Lord, and you are our God, and we bow before no other God before, but before you. You rule supreme in our hearts and in the church. And tonight I pray, O oh God, that something of your government and of your order and of your power would fill this place, that the authority of heaven would be released into our lives, O oh God that even those who are watching tonight, that your power would surge into their homes or wherever they are located right now, that God, the very presence that fills this place and the authority that is released in this place would fill them in that place, O oh God. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you come to make the things of Jesus real in each one of us, accessible to us, and that you lead and guide us into all truth. And we yield to you tonight. We will not quench you. We will not grieve you. We will not hinder you. We will not blaspheme you. But, O oh God, we say, have your way in this place. Come touch every life here tonight, O oh God. Those that are watching, touch them, O oh God. Manifest your power and fill our lives with that glory, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, after he was raised from the dead, and I'm so grateful while I was worshiping, I was looking back at the cross, and we know that it's an empty cross, because he, at the cross he died. At the cross, he gave his life as an exchange for us. The spotless Lamb of God, the sacrifice was paid in full for our redemption. Hallelujah. 
that dark moment, that moment filled with such agony, was for our absolute salvation, deliverance, healing, the glory of God that had been, as it were, isolated from common man by a curtain that hung in the tabernacle and in the temple, this thick curtain that only the high priest could go in once a year after much ablutions and preparation. That curtain at that moment was torn from top to bottom, and now we have access to the inner sanctum of God, but God has, inner, has access to our lives through that great work of redemption. As I gazed at the empty cross, I realized that Jesus not only died for our sins, but he was buried. And he went and he spoiled principalities and powers, triumphing over them through the cross. And then on the third day, he was raised again. The power of resurrection was so strong that even some who were in tombs came out at the same time and were seen in Jerusalem. He revealed himself to the disciples, even to Thomas. He felt him. He felt his body. It wasn't just a, an appearance. He was there physically and visibly. And he ministered to the disciples in those 40 days and preparing them for Pentecost, Pentecost being 50 days after Passover. Pentecost, significant celebration. The, it is the celebration of the harvest. How significant was that day that God chose to pour out the Spirit upon the believers and upon the church and upon all flesh? The day of harvest. The feast of first fruits. And that day was selected, and 10 days before Pentecost, Jesus is wrapping up his ministry with his disciples, with his friends, with the apostles of the church. And he says these words to them But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they watched, when he had spoken these things, what things? The promise of the Father, the coming and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit upon their lives, that they would walk in the power of the Spirit, just like Jesus had been anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power and went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Now that same Spirit that had been on Jesus was going to be upon these men and women in the upper room. And every subsequent believer that would ask and desire and press would be the recipients of this same outpouring. Hallelujah. You shall receive power, dunamis power, God's power in these bodies. The very power that was on Jesus, the empty cross, the empty tomb. The resurrected, glorified Christ, his last words to his disciples is, you shall receive power. They were not just meant to be forgiven. A new creation, new beginnings. But these new beginnings, these born again, these who had come out of darkness into marvelous light were to be empowered the normal Christian life is the powerful life. This is not just a life for the apostles, for the, uh, for the early church. This is from that day to the day of His return. And I want to show you that because some people feel like the Holy Spirit was on the apostles and in the early church and now we've been left with the Bible. 
as important as the Bible is, and we study it, and we believe it from cover to cover, and we love the Word of God, and it is the Word of God to us. It is perfect in all its ways. He's not a man that he should lie. He watches over his Word to perform it. We shouldn't take away from it. We shouldn't add to it. But we don't just live by the Bible. The Word in itself is not what we were given. We were given the Word and the Spirit. I love the Bible. I've devoted my life to the study of it, to the teaching of it. have thousands of students in nine different languages around the world studying the Word. If I didn't believe the Word, I wouldn't teach the Word. I teach the Word. I walk the Word. I talk the Word. I live the Word. However, you cannot just do that. You've got to have the empowerment of the Spirit. Jesus said it, yeah, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses. The word witness is an interesting word because we, we know what a witness is in the courts, someone that declares what they have seen, what they've experienced. It also means to record. People record what they have seen, what they've experienced. But it also means martyr. In other words, Leon's expanded unpublished translation says, you shall receive the very power of God, the dunamis, the dynamite power of God in your life when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be martyrs. You will preach the gospel even in the face of, of insurmountable odds and opposition, but you will not be afraid because you will have the very power of God that was on Jesus will be upon you. Hallelujah. When he had spoken these things, what things? You shall receive power. Someone say power. power. You shall receive power. You've got to get it from your belly. You've got to get it from the depth of your being. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. When he had spoken these things, they watched and he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who has, been, who has taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. To me, that is the funniest scripture in the entire Bible. You'll say, why is that funny? Well, just, just put yourself there for a moment. You had been with Jesus for three years. You saw him crucified, resurrected, and he's now given his final instructions, and he's caught up as you're watching him go. No one has ever seen this event. The closest they've seen were those that saw Elijah go up in a fiery chariot. No one has seen Jesus going into heaven. How many of you know that's a monumental moment in all of time from Genesis to his return? This is a pivotal moment. And these disciples are standing there with their mouths hanging open, watching their friend, their Lord, their Savior, their Deliverer, their Healer, their hope, being caught up in glory. Put yourself there. Put yourself in the emotion of that moment. Watching Him go up. And these two angels appear and they say to the disciples these words it just blows me away why do you stand gazing up into heaven like dude dude jesus has just gone up we watched him going i live in tampa florida i'm about two hours ride from the Space Center in Merritt Island, Cocoa Beach. And when they send rockets up, I go outside my house and I can stand there. I can actually watch the 
spacecraft going up. I missed SpaceX because I was here with you. Uh, I should have seen it, but we had a storm, and so they canceled it. I, I was watching the whole preparation to the countdown, and then they scrubbed it. But I would have seen it had I not been with you all. I missed that moment in space history. <laughs> but this is a much greater moment. I, I stand there and I want to start singing the national anthem when I watch those spacecraft going up. These men are standing watching Jesus, the Son of God who died for them, who was buried, who came out the tomb, now blasting into glory. And the two angels say, why are you standing gazing into heaven? That's why it's the funniest scripture for me. Like, dude, Jesus. Okay, he's gone. He promised he's coming again. He's given you instruction. Get doing what he told you to do. That's Leon's expanded commentary. Why do you stand gazing into heaven? One of the most significant days in all of Bible truth. Jesus going into heaven, ascending into heaven to the right hand of the Father. And the angels say, why are you gazing? Because they didn't want them just to stand gazing. They had been given an assignment to stay in Jerusalem so that they may be endured with high, and then they were going to take the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so, from that moment, they returned to Jerusalem in uh, Acts chapter 2, where we picked up last night. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all there with one accord in one place. That's significant. Unity in prayer. Unity in faith. Unity in expectation. Unity in obedience. They were in one place. Some people minimize the importance of church. Some people feel you can be, you can worship God on the golf course. It's true. You'll pray when you hit a bad shot. Oh, God, please let it hit a tree and bounce back into the fairway. Billy Graham said, God always answers prayer except on the golf course. You can worship God on the golf course. You can worship God on your boat catching fish. But there is a time when you're meant to be together not forsaking the assembling together. They were given instruction by Jesus to go to Jerusalem and to wait for the promise of the Father that was of such vital importance to their lives that He said, I command you to stay. He said, I'm sending you into all the world. But before you go into all the world, you must receive power because you can't do this in your energy, your strength, your ability. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. There are some things we can do. We can send a spacecraft to the moon. We can send a spacecraft to another spacecraft going around the, the, the earth. There are a lot of things we can do as mere men. You understand? Man has tremendous brilliance because we've been created in the image of God. But when it comes to the work of God, it is by the Spirit of God. It's God who's at work in you both to will and to do. It's God who energizes our lives. It's God who gives us the ability. It's God who gives us the words to speak. It's God that gives us the release to speak. He leads, He guides, He directs. We cannot do this out of our own creativity, imagination, ability, wisdom, knowledge, skill. It needs, our lives need the power of God. It reminds me of Ezekiel. He's in front of the valley of dry bones. 
And God says to him to prophesy to the bones. When he prophesies, the spirit moves. There is a tremendous union in man and God working together. Jesus, a man anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power, went about. He was led. He was empowered by the Spirit. The supernatural work of God is done through men who are healed, it, surrendered, submitted, led and directed by the Spirit of God. God has chosen to work through us in this time called the church age. Man has let God down so many times, and yet God believes in us more than we do in ourselves. If I were God, and I'm certainly not, you can just ask a couple of people, they will tell you how far I am from being God. But if I were God and I wanted to redeem the world, I would just speak from the heavens and say, I'm doing a countdown, and if you want to be saved, I give you 10 seconds to make a life-changing decision. Nine, eight, seven, four, two, bingo. <laughs> you can see why I'm not God. Because I would play with people. But He doesn't. He has chosen in His love, He gave the least to man, Adam on earth, to have dominion through man. And that's why the Redeemer came as a man. There had to be the incarnation. God had to become man to save man. God had to fulfill the Word of God. Man had to do it. And so Jesus, a man anointed with the Holy Spirit, He wasn't operating in His divinity, in His deity. He was operating in His humanity as a man anointed with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me. This day the Word is fulfilled. He was the fulfillment of the Word, and the Spirit was working through Him, and then He could preach the gospel. He could open the eyes of the blind. He could be, bring deliverance to the captives. He could preach the acceptable year of the Lord because He was a man anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. And Jesus said to the disciples, The glory that the Father has given to me I give to you. And you shall do the works that I do when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He had not yet been poured out. He said, but if you believe the works that I do, you will do also. But for that to take place, you've got to be in Jerusalem. And yeah, we are on the day of Pentecost. They've gathered with one accord in one place. They're in unity. They're in expectation. They're there in faith. They there in obedience, waiting on God, 10 days. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. In other words, this is important. Why was there a sound from heaven? This isn't of man's doing. This is of God. Man is only cooperating with God. When we position ourselves before God, we are cooperating with God. We're not quenching Him. We're not shutting Him out. We are surrendering our lives to God, the Holy Spirit, saying, God, please come and fill me and use me and let me be your voice extended. Let me be your hands extended. Let me be your light in my world. When the sound came from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind. It's just like when God breathed in Adam. And he became a living soul. God's breath came again. And empowered the church. And fire sat on each one of them. Divided tongues of fire sat on each one. Notice something. When this event took place. That the breath of God blew. The fire of God sat on each one of them. Not most of them, each one of them, and they were all filled. Notice the word all, A L L. You say all. But again, brother, pastor, the Greek is all. You just have to read it. Ask God to give you insight into that thing, it will come to you. <laughs> they were all filled. Not most of them, some of them, they were all filled. This is important. 
Because it's God's will that we all be filled. It's not God's will that you have to operate in this dimension of faith and anointing and power out of your own energy and ability and self-anointing. It's the anointing of God that was on Jesus that will be upon you. And He filled them all. If they were not all filled, someone could turn around and say, well, it's not for me. I'm identified with that one that didn't receive it. You understand? Hey, Thomas didn't get it. Or what about Mary, the mother of Jesus? She didn't get it. That would have given a solution to those who say, it's not for me. But because they were all filled, even Thomas, Peter who denied him, Mary, the mother of Jesus, they were all there. They all received, not most of them, some of them, they all received. Therefore, there is hope for all of us to receive this same outpouring. One of the scriptures, someone said to me, I don't believe that this is for me. And uh, I quoted Mark 16, these signs shall follow them who believe. And one of the signs is that they'll speak in other tongues. I said, if you don't believe, it's not for you. This is for a believer, someone who believes the word of God, believes it's for them, then it's for them. If you don't believe it's for you, if you believe that when the last apostle died, that it's no longer applicable because now we have the Bible, then you probably are not going to receive because your unbelief is already shutting you off to what God wants to do in and through your life. It, it takes faith to receive. You're not receiving because of an emotion. You're not receiving because of a feeling. Even though there was great emotion in that room, and I'm sure there were great feelings. You cannot have a God invasion of this nature and not feel something. But notice that there's no emphasis on their feelings and on their emotions in this encounter. And the Holy Spirit is very clear in doing this because all Scripture is given for doctrine. If there were certain manifestations and emotions that were highlighted, then if we don't have that same emotion, we would somewhat be short of what God wanted to do. So He doesn't highlight any emotion, any feeling in this encounter. He doesn't talk about uh, Thomas spinning around and shouting at the top of his voice. Peter lying on the ground crying like a baby. He doesn't speak about the emotion of the disciples and not even the emotion of his mother Mary. You understand? He just says they all received. And as they all received, they began to speak with other tongues. Notice, they began to speak with other tongues. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Notice, God didn't speak. They spoke. The Spirit gave them utterance. When the Spirit came upon them, it says that they, as they cooperated with God, as this language, this ecstatic language from the depth of their being started to bubble forth, they gave utterance to it and began to speak. At this stage, there'd been no teaching on speaking on other tongues. It was unknown. It's not like I go into a church and I can talk on my experience in the Holy Spirit and I can talk about speaking in other tongues. There was no speaking in other tongues up to this point. So they didn't have a reference to anchor themselves. It was the Holy Spirit spontaneously coming upon them. But they were not robotic beings because God has given us free will. So they are in cooperation with God. And as the Spirit comes upon them, they all begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gives them utterance. Uh, some people get the idea that if God wants to fill you, then He's going to take your vocal cords and re ba ra ba ra ba ra ba and you just stand there going, oh, oh, oh. no, you speak. The Spirit gives you utterance. You don't even understand what you're saying with your mind. 
But you begin to speak that word, and it's either going to be an ancient language, a heavenly language, or a known language, depending on how God wants to operate through you at that given point in time. And so they began to speak. Notice it doesn't say that Peter shouted and Thomas whispered. It gives no volume. Why? Because if he had given a volume, then when we receive, we would have to have it at that exact doctrinal point. There would have to be that volume. There would have to be that emotion. There is no emotion. There is no volume included here. It is just received by faith from generation to generation. The promises to you and to your sons and to your daughters and to them that are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. This promise is available from generation to generation, as many as are called by God. Are you called by God? Then this promise is for you today. There is no emotion highlighted. There is no feeling highlighted. There is no volume highlighted. It's just they received by faith and began to speak as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, because they'd come there because of the feast. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. So they were not just speaking in heavenly languages. They were speaking, these Galileans were speaking in, in known languages to these people visiting Jerusalem. I've had it happen to me on two occasions where I've spoken that I know of in a known language. One happened in Champaign-Urbana. Illinois. I was preaching and there was a lady who was a, a PhD, a lecturer in linguistics at the university, UConn, and I began to speak in her language in the meeting. She came to me and she said, do you know what you said? I said, I have no idea what I said. You began to speak to me by the Spirit of God and gave me specific instructions as you were speaking in other tongues in my own language. The second occasion was in Bulgaria. I was, um, I was ministering. It was a weird meeting because uh, the Iron Curtain had come down. The church started to emerge, a new generation. There had been Pentecostals who had paid a tremendous price. But this new generation of believer with modern worship, all that came together. But we couldn't get a building. So we rented <laughs> We rented a movie house that was used for pornographic movies. <laughs> and we could get it from 7 to 9. <laughs> and I had to start the meeting at 7 and be out by 9 because when we left, they were going to start to show porn. And the place was packed with God-hungry people. Every seat was taken. And the Spirit of God began to move in unusual ways. And there were many gypsies that had come in from the Black Sea area. They had come to these meetings because they heard about what God was doing. And so they would come into the meetings. And I had all those gypsies come stand front. And I began to pray over them. When I got to one pastor, I began to speak in foreign tongues. And I knew it was a shift in the tongue. It was a different tongue to the normal tongue that I speak. And I was very conscious, I'm ex-military, so I'm very conscious of time. Timing is very important to me. Punctuality is very important to me. And so I was very aware that I had like, you know, 30 minutes to wrap this thing up. I had to get through this whole line of God-hungry people. Fortunately, the power of God was falling really powerfully on them and releasing them. But I got to this one man, and I begin to speak in other tongues. And I'm talking and I'm thinking, okay, dude, bring it in and move to the next person. And I, I feel in the spirit that I shouldn't stop. I feel compelled to continue. And I'm like struggling because 
my military mind is kicking in and I'm saying, I've got about 30 minutes to get this thing done. I'm looking at my watch and praying in the Holy Ghost at the same time. And I, and I want to bring it in. I want to get to the next person. I, the Holy Spirit doesn't let me go. Compels me to stay. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, 30 minutes. I stop. I'm released. Now quickly run down the line. I say, get out of here. Go, go, go. Porno's about to come on. <laughs> you had to be there. <laughs> we head out I take some of the pastors out for a meal it was really cool because I, I, I was prospered by God and I'd chosen to finance 200 gypsy pastors with enough salary for an entire year that they wouldn't have to receive an offering that they could build their churches and that their school fees for their kids, their food would be paid. So I'd, I'd selected these pastors, all the lead ones that I was going to use to release the funds to these gypsy pastors. And I took them to a pizza hut. There was a pizza hut in Sofia, Bulgaria. And I must have had like a table of 20 or 25. And we all ate pizza and we all had sodas. And then the bill came and it was so cool because the bill was, say, $100 for 20 people. You know what I'm saying? It was, I think it was less. And so I, I paid the bill, and my waiter, he was a young man. I gave him 100% of what the bill was. I gave him, I said, this is for the bill, and this is for you. And the guy just dropped to the ground. He fainted. <laughs> and he got up, and he was crying. He says, you gave me too much money. I said, no, I didn't. I gave you exactly what I wanted to give you. It was like two years salary for him, the equivalent of where they were in the economy at that time. He was just so overwhelmed. And it cost me nothing. You know what I'm saying? It was, just, it was such a joy. Anyway, out of that pastoral meeting, the guy tells me what happened. When you were speaking, when you were praying in other tongues, you were speaking in fluent Turkish. He says, I'm a pastor from the Black Sea area. I'm actually operating in Turkey. And you began to speak to me in my own language that I speak, that I minister in. And you were giving me the names of people in my congregation of what God would be doing in their lives, who was sick and who would be healed, who would be raised up as part of my leadership. For 30 minutes, you gave me instructions concerning my, my church in my language. And his little church from that day exploded. It's become one of the great churches in that nation because of that release of that word. And so there are times we speak in heavenly languages, ancient languages, known languages, and in this case it was a known language. It was a sign to those people. Now as a believer, when you're in your prayer closet, you are not probably speaking in an ancient language. It is your spirit communicating direct to the Spirit of God, bypassing the limits and the boundaries of your mind. You are speaking deep cries out to deep, spirit to spirit, and you worshiping God or you're praying in the Spirit. And you're building yourself up in your most holy faith. You are actually like recharging your life. I think if Christians understood the power of speaking in other tongues, in their prayer language, that they would pray more in the Spirit. 90% of your prayer life should be in the Spirit. And 10% in your known language. Why? Because you are praying the will of God. Direct to God. And then you make your requests known in your known language with thanksgiving. And you receive by faith. And bam! You are starting to walk in the supernatural of God. He's given us this private prayer language. Spirit to spirit. Deep to deep. Your spirit to the spirit of God. Without the mind getting in the way. But in that time your mind is unfruitful. And that's when if you are insecure in speaking in other tongues the devil can work havoc in your mind and say you're repeating yourself you're making this up how many of you have ever had that happen to you 
you're praying and you sound, well, uh, this is how we sound. One of the keys to breaking free from that is don't whisper. I know sometimes you have to because you've got family and you get up. I'm sure some of you get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to have your devotions and pray before work. You don't want to wake the whole household up. But you can raise your voice a little bit and just pray out loud. Don't whisper. Don't go, speak it. The more you speak it, the more you will articulate it. If you whisper it, it's very hard to articulate and watch the changing in tone as you take on different postures in prayer. There is a a, 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 a language when I in church and I speak in other tongues like you did, I will have a certain sound to it. But in my prayer closet, it has another sound. And then other times I feel the authority of God in it. It has another sound. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And you go into what I call diversities of tongues. Now you start to break into dimensions in the spirit, which these apostles and disciples and followers of Jesus had, you have that same power, that same access in the Spirit. Hallelujah. I love speaking in other tongues. When I got saved, I didn't even know, well, I didn't know Scripture, so I knew nothing about tongues. So when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit while I was asleep, I woke up speaking in other tongues. I didn't know what that was. And so I was a member of a Pentecostal church, full gospel church. And they didn't really like me much because I was a surfer. I had long, blonde hair. Long, very long. Jeans, really faded and worn out and not just bought you know today you can buy torn jeans mine were earned they were the real deal it wasn't like a cheap <laughs> manufactured tear it was torn through days and days of wearing and not washing as a hippie fairly clean one most of the time as a mix military but my jeans were worn and I had sandals and because of the board those days I had big calluses on my feet because of paddling the skin. You, you get big knobs on your feet from paddling and I had those. So I didn't wear shoes or wore flip-flops, t-shirts, long hair. And I go to church, a Pentecostal church, and they were totally freaked out. But somehow they put up with me. And they one day announced, we're going to have a Holy Spirit receiving night, a tarry night, they called it. So I went to this tarry night, and there were a couple of people there that were tarrying. And um, you had to be there. You know, Pentecostals have a certain way of doing things. I, to be honest, I'm really not into Pentecostalism. I'm into the upper room. You know, I don't necessarily like all the mannerisms of tradition that has come in, that has made and identified us as the church. I think some of that is just like extras, and they're not bad. they just like, they're there. So, but this was the there on steroids. <laughs> These guys were on the carpet, and they're slamming their hands and they're slamming their hands, and they're crying, and they're shouting, and they're begging. And I'm lying next to one dude, and, and, and he's dressed in his black suit, and he's, he's a young kid, but he's got short hair. He's really the Pentecostal classic kid of that generation. And, and, um, and, and, and he's praying, and he's appealing. He says, God, if you give this to me, I'll never sin again. <laughs> and I'm thinking, wow. <laughs> That's a huge promise to make to God. <laughs> well, I'm a brand new Christian. I'm saved, but I know how to sin, man. And the only difference was I didn't want to now that I was saved. I still did, but I just didn't want to. <laughs> and he's making a deal with God. I'll never sin again. And I start pricking up my ears. And he starts cutting a deal. I'll not do this and I'll not do that. And I'm thinking, whoa, dude, bring your voice down. <laughs> Anyway, 
and he's crying and he's slamming his hand and others are crying and slamming their hands. God, please, please, please. And I'm lying there going, Rebi si kibre bele me cobro. And I'm thinking, this can't be it. Because I'm not crying, I'm not rolling, I'm not shouting, I'm not making deals with God. This is too easy. <laughs> no, this isn't it. This can't be it. The, the thought even crossed my mind. A demon's giving this to me. Because this is too easy. So the pastor at the end, he says, how many have you received? And about three hands go up and I stand there. I'm, I still don't. I, I received weeks ago in my bedroom at two o'clock in the morning. I spoke in other tongues. I just hadn't had teaching. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know that I could continue in it. And when I did try and continue it in, I thought, wow, this just sounds like I'm making it up. I don't understand what I'm saying. I, I, had no un, I had no clarification. My mind was unfruitful, and I'm thinking thoughts like, you're making this up. You sound like you're repeating yourself. I wonder if this is from a demon. I don't know the scripture of we being evil give good gifts to our children. How much more will he give the Holy Spirit that he's not going to give us a serpent? He's not going to give us a demon when we ask him for the Spirit. But I had no anchor for my soul, for my mind in the Word of God. So... I walked out. I didn't raise my hand. And I got in my Volkswagen camper with my beads, my eight-track move there. But now I felt guilt because I was listening to Black Sabbath, <laughs> Grand Funk Railroad, Deep Purple, Smoke on the Water, Jimi Hendrix. Joe Cocker, I get high with a little help from my friend, and I've got all that music between my seats. So I thought I should get some Christian music to play. I went to the Christian bookstore, and they had Jimmy Swaggart at his height. And I used to think, oh, God, I want to serve you, but do I have to listen to this music? No offense to those that like Southern Gospel, but it, when you've grown up in the in the in the Woodstock culture that sounded bad I used to try and do it and I could oh God please forgive me I just need a little help from my friends here <laughs> then I got a there was a Christian group called the Fisher Folk they played like the mandolin and a guitar and a banjo. And they were very sweet singers, but it was like, like, like folk music, Christian folk music. And that didn't sit well with me either. Then one day there was a guy who was part of the Jesus movement called Larry Norman. And he was at least rocking a little bit. And I thought, woohoo, I can listen to some good music and be saved. Anyway, I get in my Volkswagen camper, my beads, my incense. I wasn't burning it to God's. I just loved the smell of sandalwood incense in my surf wagon, all my boards on top. And I get in, and the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says, you're not making this up. You're believing a lie. You have received. And he takes me to the time when he filled me, and he said, I want you to speak it out loud. I want you to sing it out loud. I'd never heard anyone singing in the Spirit. Never heard anyone singing in the Spirit up to that point. It wasn't in the churches. Not my church. Churches. My church. Little full gospel church. Jimmy Swaggart music at its best. No wonder they couldn't sing in the Spirit. They were singing Southern Gospel. <laughs> you have to get saved. And so I progressed into the Spirit, into singing in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit, started to believe it, and then I watched it like expand in my capacity. But the one thing I noticed, and it goes back to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, is I led my first soul to the Lord at 6 o'clock in the morning. I received the baptism in the Spirit at 2 o'clock. 
I couldn't wait. It's six o'clock. I said to my wife, go wake up Wendy. She was our next door neighbor. We used to party together. Her, her boyfriend was my surfboard builder, Larry. I said, go get Wendy. And Wendy came into the living room. And uh, she had a blue gown on. And she had bed head. And she's sitting there all cross-eyed, 6 o'clock in the morning. And I said, and I began to witness to her. I shared my testimony of how I got saved. My life was changed. And I led my first soul to the Lord at 6 o'clock in the morning. And then after that event, I started to go out, and, and, and I think I may have told you the story. I was going to movies before I was saved, and there were Jesus people on the street handing out tracts, singing with guitars. This is the day, this is the day. And, and they gave me a tract, and I was very cool. And I, I had this beautiful long coat. It made Joseph's coat look tame because it was made of many colors, it was hand-sewn Sutu blanket, Lusutu blanket um, that I had tailored into a long coat that I could wear when I came out of the surf. And I had my beads and my white cotton pants on and my white cotton shirt because I was into the Eastern religion thing and my beads and my long hair. And, and I'm walking and they give me this track and I look at them and I, I crumple it up and I throw it over my shoulder. And I, think, and I said to, to, to my girlfriend, I said, you'll never catch me doing what they're doing. Well, a couple of weeks later, I'm on the street. <laughs> this is the day. This is the day. Would you like one of these? Would you like one of these? <laughs> I received power. Started to lead people to Christ. Laid hands on them for the baptism in the Spirit. Prayed the prayer of faith over their sick bodies. Have started going to all my relatives. My relatives were all sick, all diseased. I used to hate it. As a kid, my, my parents used to insist I go to visit my grandparents. Well, I come from another country, so I didn't even speak their language. And then we'd have to go sit there. On Sunday, they were Dutch reform. I call them much deformed. Um, we would sit in our suits. Sunday, you're not allowed to do anything. You're not allowed to play. You're not allowed to run. You're not allowed to Yet it's sit. It was a holy day. And I'd sit in my suit, listen to them. My grandma would say, this is for my water. This is for my blood pressure. This is for my heart. This is for my lungs. This is for other parts of my body that I can't speak about now. And, and, and all my family were sick and diseased. So I started to go visit them, and I started to pray over them and watch God heal them. And then I'd lead them to the Lord. Do you understand? Because I received power. I didn't just get tongues. I just, I, I love tongues. It's, it's important. It's vital. But I didn't just get tongues. I got power. And I want to conclude with this. The Holy Spirit is a soul-winning spirit. You cannot authentically be filled with the Spirit and not have a passion for the harvest. You may not be called to be evangelist, but your heart must beat with the unison of God's part, and that is to feel the urgency to reach the harvest. You may not be skilled, but you know you have a message. You are God's voice extended, and you're not ashamed of the gospel because you are willing to even suffer rejection, persecution. You don't mind what people think about you because you've got power. I was standing on the street sharing the gospel. My torn jeans, my flip-flops, my surface shirt, my long coat looking very cool, my beads. Bag, sling bag around me with my tracks, my chick tracks, little comic chick tracks. You're going to hell. It was my favorite one. I had all my, and my New Testaments, every cent I had that I didn't use for rent, surfboard wax, and um, fuel, I would go buy tracks, and New Testaments, I tithed from the first week I was saved, and I would go buy Bibles, New Testaments, tracks, and I'd go out on the street. One day I was going out on the street, I'll come back to my story, and it was raining, it was pouring, and so I sat under the bus stop, and an old man came out with a Bible, and he sat next to me, and I looked at his old, old Bible in his hands, 
and his suit, and I could tell he was Pentecostal by his suit, he had a black suit and a big black Bible. I said, are you going to join me on the streets tonight? Let's go reach souls. He said, no, son, I'm going to church. <laughs> so we got talking because it was raining, and um, he said, come with me. And uh, so I went to church with him, and he was a legend. He was a true apostle from the Belgium Congo, one of the pioneer missionaries that forged the gospel in Africa. And uh, when the Mau Mau revolution, hey, he had to escape and he came to South Africa. He was, he was an old man, but he was, a, he, was a, um, he was a Bible scholar extreme, especially in eschatology. In, and he would sit and mentor me and teach me. Whenever I was not on the street, I'd go to his apartment, which was right across the road from mine, and uh, I would go sit there and say, teach the word to me, teach the word to me, and he would teach the word. So I met this guy. Back to the streets. I'm on the streets preaching just outside uh, this place called Happy Valley, um, which is the very beach. I was a pro-lifeguard on that beach. That was my beach, and I'm standing on my beach with Happy Valley, and uh, I'm preaching, and a, a guy comes up to me and says, you don't know what you're doing, sonny boy. I said, I know. I said, I've just got saved. I said, would you help me? He said, no, I'm too busy. So as he's walking away, I said, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing until one day I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I received power, man. I, I may not have had it all right, but... In spite of what I didn't know, I did know the reality of my salvation. I did have a passion for the lost. I had received power. I was unafraid. I was not ashamed. And so I began to preach. How did I get into my first church? I'm preaching on the street. An African lady. I'm also an African, but she was a black African. Torso woman. I, I hand out a tract to her, and I stand talking to her, and I minister to her. She says oh, you've got to come to my church. I said, sure, I'll come to your church. So she takes my name and my phone number, and she calls me. She says, can you come this um, Sunday? I said, sure. So we're living in the height of apartheid. Whites are not allowed in black townships. Blacks can come into the white townships, but they have to have a passbook. I didn't have a uh, uh, a certificate to go into the area. So they say to me, are you going to come? I said, of course I'm going to come. They said, well, what about your past? I said, I don't care. I said, Jesus said, go into all the world. <laughs> and that's all the world, and I'm going in. <laughs> so they were happy. I showed up. It was an Anglican church. How many of you know what an Anglican church is? It's an Episcopalian church. And all I've got up to that point is my pastor, my personal Bible readings, I've got the baptism in the Holy Ghost, and Jimmy Swaggart, <laughs> who I listen to prolifically. And so I don't like his music, but I like his preaching. So I've got Jimmy Swaggart. So I go into this Anglican church, and I begin to preach. So I give the altar call and I said, now those who want to be born again, to give your heart to the Lord, to truly follow him, please stand. And the whole church stands. I say, sit down. And I preach my message. This time I turn it up. I'm like Jimmy Swagger to go even hotter, man. Hotter. I just like really lay it on. You cannot just have religion. You've got to be born again. You've got to be baptized. You've got to be filled with the Spirit. Those who want to give your heart to the Lord and you really, really mean it, stand. And everyone stood. I said, sit down. <laughs> I preach it again. This time I turn it up really hot. And so I give the altar call. and say, now those who want to get saved and get filled with the Holy Spirit, I'm going to just do both at the same time. I'm going to lay hands on them for the baptism and the Spirit right there, like in the house of Cornelius. While he yet spoke, the Spirit fell. I'm believing right there that they're going to get saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. Then I'm going to find water and baptize these Anglicans. I don't know what Anglicans believe. I'm a hippie. Give me a break. I'm not there looking for doctrinal differences. And they have this high platform 
So I'm standing up there and I close my eyes and, and there's a tug at my pants. And it's the archbishop of the entire region. He says, I want to get my heart right with God. I want to get saved. I want to get filled with this Holy Spirit that you're speaking about. I led that entire church and the archbishop of the entire region to the Lord that night, laid hands on them for the baptism in the Spirit. Why? Because I received power. I didn't have knowledge. I didn't have skill. I didn't have training. As a hippie, saved a few weeks. But through witnessing this door opened on the street, she must have gone to her pastor, this um, uh, the father, and said, you've got to get this young guy. He's radical on fire on the streets preaching. Bring him to the church. We need this. And he gave permission, and I went in and preached. And then other doors, other churches opened. That's how I got into the ministry, because of preaching on the street. The thing I said I would never do a few weeks before. You shall receive power. Hallelujah. You don't just live as a mere citizen of planet earth. You're a representative of God, an ambassador of God. You cannot be baptized in the Holy Spirit without having a passion for the harvest. The Spirit of God is a soul winning spirit. Jesus had a soul winning spirit upon him. The early church, the, they got tongues, they got fire. Peter stood up, began to preach, and 3,000 people got saved. Everyone celebrates speaking in other tongues. I celebrate 3,000 saved. And Peter ends his sermon. Go with me to Acts chapter 2. Let me bring it in for a landing. Yeah. <laughs> I got deviated. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 17, it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see vision. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I'll pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. Supernatural living. Not only for your biological family, but for our spiritual sons and daughters. Entering into the dimension of vision, dreams, Prophetic power, hallelujah. And then he goes on and he speaks about signs in the heavens. And then he says this, and it shall come to pass. Well, you'd say pass. It shall come to pass, in the Greek, pastor. That whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The baptism in the Spirit did empower them and did give them the ability to speak in known languages and in heavenly languages and be empowered, but they got the soul-winning spirit, the very reason for Pentecost. Harvest that day, I believe, in closing, that the Holy Spirit that was on Jesus is the Holy Spirit that is on us. The spirit of Pentecost is more than a heavenly language or a known language, but it is power for the harvest. Let's stand and let's pray. How many of you got something out of this tonight? Who felt like challenged again just in your spirit about the purpose of Pentecost? Anyone here feel that? Yeah? How many of you feel like you, you were challenged to reawaken speaking in tongues in your prayer closet? How many of you felt that? How many say, yeah, I need to just stir myself in my most holy faith? Of, I pray, but I'm not praying enough in the spirit. I sing, but I don't sing enough in the spirit. And so you've been challenged in that. How many of you feel like you've been, as it were, deceived? You received tongues, you spoke in it, but you thought you were making it up and you thought it's unimportant, you've just neglected it. Who else? Come on, who else? How, could you believe that tonight it would be reawakened for you, that you could just stir it up again? Do you believe that you could put aside the lies of the enemy just like he lied to me? I would have just walked out of that room, got in my car, listened to Deep Purple, and, and, uh, and, and missed had the Holy Spirit not told me that it was him. I would have bought into the lie because I didn't have that anchor 
But tonight you've got an anchor. You've seen they all received and they all spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them. You, you didn't get a false spirit. You didn't get a demon. You got the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So people have neglected praying in tongues. Some have neglected praying in tongues altogether, which is okay. At least you've been brutally honest with yourself. That's the beginning of being helped. It's good. This is why we have these special meetings to just go in and confront these issues. It's not to embarrass you. It's we're family. We're family. We're here to help each other. I've been there. I know what you've gone through. Done that. Got the t-shirt. <laughs> But now I speak in tongues more than you all. Why? Because I've seen that in the Word of God, and I stir myself. And now I'm strengthened in my spirit because of it. When we worshiping, I'm just praying in the Spirit all the time. Before I preach, driving up in my hotel, I'm praying in the Spirit all the time. Singing in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit. That's why I'm such an awesome preacher. <laughs> You're going to be awesome. <laughs> Yeah. And then who felt like, yeah, I've just really not got that whole soul winning thing. I didn't realize the importance of the Holy Spirit that is a soul winning spirit. And how many were challenged in that area? Anyone? Yeah. One hand, one solid, two hands. Who else? You're nodding your hand. <laughs> Over there. Who else? Over there. Over there. I like to make eye contact, not for a guilt trip, but because I want to help you. You understand? I'm, I'm going to help you. I want to break through for you. So we're going to deal with those three areas. Neglect of tongues, total neglect of tongues, neglect of soul winning spirit. We're going to pray for these three areas. That applies to you dudes at home as well. In your comfortable, lazy boy sofa, get up right now. I can see you. <laughs> don't go to football or baseball or whatever's on right now <laughs> it's not the time to switch i'm about to pray <laughs> yeah i see you there <laughs> lord god thank you for the honesty of your people not only in this house, but in their houses. Please, O oh God, revelation in their heart that this word would so take root, O oh God, with understanding that the fowl of the air would not steal the seed that you've wanted to sow into their hearts tonight on the importance of being filled with the Spirit speaking in other tongues, flowing in the power of God, prophesying dreams and visions, serving and carrying the gospel in their hearts and in their mouth to their generation. So God, please tonight, come and awaken them in these three areas, O oh God. For those that have neglected the Spirit, I want you right now just to begin to pray in the Spirit where you're standing.